Good evening and welcome to Mosaic Live at 6. It's great to have you here. We're joined by Pastor Amanda and we are in for a treat tonight. This morning was incredible, Amanda. I absolutely loved your preach. I've got Thanks, that man. many notes that we've got a lot to get through tonight. So hopefully everyone's settled <laughs> in for the next hour. Um, but before we jump into the deep stuff, we've got two things that we need to talk about. Yeah, okay. The first one is this morning, you said that you drove around the ring road and you were praying for the city, and that's incredible, <laughs> that's very holy, but do you also pray for your safety on Coventry Ring Road? That is a crazy yeah? road, and I figured out that there's more of these in other parts of the country too, like ring roads. Ring roads, like lots ring of roads ring roads are yeah? well known. Yeah, ring roads in every city. I, I did not realize that, but the Coventry Ring Road <laughs> I don't know, we were eating with someone yesterday that said that they, the guy that when they opened it in the 70s is still on it. He's still <laughs> going around, it's just like 95 It's probably now. true, yeah. It's a hard road to get off of. Yeah. It really is. It's a scary road. When, when four lanes merge into one and you're having to cross, yeah, like that's hard. It is hard. And, and growing up here, it's hard. But then for you, you've come from America where everything's in blocks. Well, we have so much space. Yeah. Yeah, right. So it's totally different, right? So everything just kind of enters, but you're on different highways. So it, the ring road idea, um, it sounds good in theory, <laughs> but it is a really terrible experience. Yeah. It's, it really is a time that you pray. Actually, I pray more on the ring road <laughs> than I do any other road. You need to. Yeah, yeah. you do. Yeah, yeah, you need a lot of prayer life for that. You do. <laughs> well, hopefully you keep on praying for that because it is a dangerous road. <laughs> I'll pray for you too. Oh, definitely. You're gonna be, I drive you're gonna it every be. day, yeah. Yeah, you do. You have to yeah. drive it every day, don't you? I do. But I pray lots as well because I'm all right on it. <laughs> <laughs> and the You're second thing is, before we started, I saw you drink a bottle of water very, very quickly. <laughs> um, so this we've got two ridiculous. bottles of water here, and we're going to actually see who can drink it fastest. I feel like um, you're going to win, but I'm going to give it my best I'm shot. I'm not sure. I <laughs> think someone's going to get very wet. But I think, okay. is, your, is your cap closed? Yeah, my cap's closed. I've got to undo it. Yeah, we've got to make sure okay. it's undone. And then can we have someone out there to count us down? And then I think... This is, is it, tough. This is, is tough. tough. Um, so can someone count us down? We'll go from three. Scott's going to count us right now. In three, two, one, go. <laughs> Dang it! I'm joking. That makes me mad! <laughs> Can we have two more buttons? No, I'm joking. Whew. We are not doing that Do again. Do you know, though, I feel quite hydrated. <laughs> That's the first bottle of water I've had today, actually, and it feels pretty good. Does it feel pretty good? Does yeah. it make you feel good inside? I've had two cups of coffee, but no. You <laughs> no squeezed water. yours, and I just couldn't bring myself to get the squeeze in. And the problem I was, saw I, you at the corner I trapped of my it eye. here. So yeah, that's when I started oh. choking, because I got too much air. Yeah, see, yeah. now I've not choked, so I feel like I should get a point back. Like, so there I was think a point Amanda system. wins because I'm, I can't <laughs> <laughs> You really can't. It's, no, I it's can't. quite humorous, honestly. But this is but what we're going to do. It, well, I win, good. so thank you, everyone. And look you did Amanda, win. The, you the did. Brits good job. Back. The um, Brits are back. Thank you. Well done. Thank yeah. you, everyone. It's probably an Olympic sport coming soon. I think so, yeah. And I think <laughs> I can, I'm Team GB for this, <laughs> as long as I don't choke after. But we are going to jump into this morning. Um, okay, like I cool. said, it was absolutely incredible this morning. Hopefully, you can catch up if you weren't here. Um, but Amanda Bortoer, it's a new series that we're talking about. Um, yeah. Do you want to just quickly give us a synopsis of what we're going to be going through for the next four weeks? Sure, yeah. So we decided to do a four-week series on what we're calling Little Big Things. And basically, it's the little things that make the big difference. And so we're covering things like trust and gratefulness and integrity and, and how to live your life out loud and things that, that we all know matter but we don't always spend a bunch of time uh, divulging in and figuring out how to apply to our life at the stages of life we're in. So I'm really excited about this series because I think it's a really important part of the journey as we're moving into a new season, not just the Christmas season, but like into a new season for Mosaic Church and into a new season for all of us, really, who have been a part of this congregation. So it's going to be a pretty cool, pretty cool four weeks. Yes, and we're looking forward to the rest of it um, because today... We, you were talking about gratefulness yeah. um, and, and gratefulness of what has been, what is to come, um, and so on and so forth. And you, you brought three, no, four points to us today. I know. Um, I did more than three. I know. It's obviously that thing, isn't it? I've said it three is. because everyone always does three, but you broke, you broke the did. mold. Do you want to know something? I wrote three. 
And then I went back yesterday and said, I'm going to put a fourth in there. You're a maverick. I'm a maverick. You are. I'm glad that you noticed that because I thought, I'm going to change it up. I'm going to go for four. Yeah. Yeah, well we done. Well it. done, Sam, yeah. that you noticed that. But I almost stumbled because I said three originally. <laughs> you but... did. You were so used to it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I am very used to it. And I like it. It was refreshing that mm -hmm. it was different and we had four. <laughs> and we're going to jump into those now. And I, I loved um, your first point about gratefulness as a memory. Like, mm -hmm. that, was, that was incredible because I think you were saying it's um, about the 10 lepers and one return. One did a U-turn and went mm -hmm. back um, to give thanks to God yeah. and went there first. And I think like you said, that to know that a 90% didn't, mm -hmm. um, kind of, that was challenging because it made me start thinking about where have, I, where have I not gone back and said thank you to God for something that he's done? And like you said, he's done so much that if you look back on it, it will be enough to give thanks for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, can you expand on it more, just that, the, the idea that um, gratefulness has a memory and how, how important that is? Yeah, honestly, I think sometimes, you know, life just moves so quick, right? And sometimes we're so busy getting to the next whatever the next is, whatever the next day is, whatever the next season is, whatever the next experience with our kids is. And we, we end up losing that moment of thanking God for where we've come, what he's brought us through, where, where we're at now. And so when I was talking about gratefulness having a memory, I think what sticks out to me personally about that is just the willingness to constantly acknowledge the road back to Christ in all things right? The constant acknowledgement that there's tons of times in my life that God has brought me out of something. He saved us from something. I mean, for example, when Jason and I were first married, I always like to say we didn't have a pot to pee in because that was absolutely true. I mean, we were making lists of like whose house we were going to eat at at night because we, that's the level we were at. We were just getting started. And I'll never forget our first Christmas. We got home really late from shopping out of town. So we were like an hour and a half away and we decided to keep all of our Christmas gifts for whatever reason in the boot of the car. And we went inside to our apartment that we hardly could afford and we left everything in the car. And the next morning we came out and our car had been stolen. And it was devastating. Not only was our car stolen, everything in our yeah. car was stolen. And anyway, week goes by and they find the car, but all the gifts are gone. And we didn't have any money to go back out and repurchase gifts for our daughter. And I remember being just so devastated that we'd made a stupid decision, number one. And I think sometimes we do these types of things, right? We think, well, if we made a poor decision, then God's not going to bless us because we were the idiots, right? But we went to church that next Sunday. Nobody knew this. And a man walked up to Jason and he shook his hand, had one of those holy handshakes. <laughs> and, he, and he had given him $300 in his hand when he shook his hand at church, never said anything to us other than hello. And I remember that. And I'm, well, I'm saying that story because sometimes you, have, you need to remember that your gratefulness has to have that memory. Because when I do now can't afford my kids' gifts, I don't ever want to forget that moment. Yeah. That moment where God said, you know what, you, you didn't make the best decision, but I still love you. I still want your daughter to have Christmas gifts. I don't want you to feel like you're out. I don't want you to feel condemned. So he made a way for us. And so every Christmas, we actually remind our children of that story so that they never lose sight that everything we have now is still from the same source. Yeah. And that's incredible. And, and this morning you said as well that um, it was the 7th of March, wasn't it? And yeah, that's that right. right. See, you even know life day there now. There you go. And, and that, the story behind that, again, <laughs> you need to see this morning, um, it's just incredible that you go back to that point and you mm -hmm. remember that point where that miracle happened. And although what I'll say now isn't like the same scale in one sense, is um, a lot of people might not know that when Alita and I first started being in Leaf um, Coffee House, um, we had a really tough start. It was mm. really tough. We'd given up our jobs. We put everything into it. And we got to a point where we were losing money. Um, mm. And it was, we were going from bad to worse. And one day we were sat in the shop. It was the middle of the day. Like we should have been very busy. Um, we believed that we were going to be very busy and we believed that it's where God wanted us. Um, and we sat there and there was no one in the shop. And I turned to Elisa and said, it, it has to change. Like we can't do one more day like this. Mm. If we do one more day, then we've got to stop. Like we can't carry on because it will become too much. And um, we sat in the shop and we prayed and, and we just said, God, like, if this is where you want us to be, then we need 
this amount of money um, tomorrow. And if we do that, then we know. So we laid a fleece, which we'd never done before. Um, wow. And I'd never, never considered doing that before. But at that point, I was like, we need to know because otherwise it's going to go south very quickly. Um, and the next day we hit that number and then the next day we hit that number again and then again and then more and then more. And if you were to look at a graph of our earnings, yeah. it would show from that day that we prayed that God came through instantly. It wasn't as if it was a week later, God came through that. And something we try and do ourselves is to remember that without God, um, even though we believe that's where God wanted us, it was that moment of praying like, God, you, like, we need you now. Yeah. Um, and I truly believe if we didn't do that, then we wouldn't be where we are now and yeah. have the shop still. And um, what you were saying this morning, it kind of resonated so much that you, mm. you need to be thankful for those things because it's so easy to lose sight of. Because yeah. it, it's there, you've moved to here. Exactly. But it's still part of your story. That's um, right. And it's so easy to overlook and think, oh yeah, but maybe just more people saw us that day. But it's not, it was, it's God. No, you're right. I think life moves so quick that we don't take time sometimes to just say, okay, Lord, I'm just grateful for where you brought us, what you've done. And we don't tell the stories enough. I mean, the stories like we're sharing with today, yeah. the stories that I shared in church this morning, we just don't share them enough because they really do recenter us. Telling a story about where God brought you from just recenters you back yeah. to that moment, right? And some people don't want to go back. They are afraid of the emotion of going back to that place, not realizing that God has also redeemed that. He's redeemed that emotion, where eventually what started as a wound becomes a scar of victory. It becomes a place that you're now not afraid for people to touch it. As yeah. long as it's a wound, it's never free of that, right? It can never be a testimony. Yeah. But if it becomes a scar, Jesus said when Thomas needed to see his scars here, Look at them. I don't mind you seeing where I've come from. Yeah. Um, there's something special about that. That's incredible, yeah. And it's something you said this morning, again, was about your testimony. Like, you've got that, and that's a voice of, um, I've got exactly what you said there, the testimony you have for a grateful heart. Mm. And again, I think so many people can feel as if their, their story isn't enough. It isn't enough for someone to hear. They're thinking that they need more and more. And then they kind of hide their testimony away. They're, they're sitting there and they're like, oh, my mind's not going to touch anyone. Um, but everyone's got a story and God's oh come through gosh. for everyone. Whether you've just been in church all your life and you just come through and you're like, yeah, God is, God is the right. like, Lord of my life. Or someone that's come from a different side and all of a sudden God's entered their life in a, in a big bang. And people always think that that's the story that matters, but everyone's matters because everyone's oh, totally. on a journey. I couldn't agree more. I think people need to tell their story more. Yeah. I don't think people do that enough. Yeah. I don't. I think people, if they were really honest, their story is probably one of the most impactful things in their family. Some people don't see the breakthrough they want to see, not because God's not was withholding, but because they're unwilling to share their story. Yeah. They're unwilling to get into the depths of where God brought them from. But it is the most powerful tool we all have. We overcome by the word of our testimony and the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus has already been done. You, you control none of that. That's already been done for you. But the word of your testimony is part of your ability to overcome. Yeah. And I think that leads well into what you were saying as your second point, that gratefulness is unhindered. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes people hinder themselves by not telling their story. And Definitely. Hold, like withholding that from people. But the truth is, whatever your story, whatever you've come from, if, even if you're ashamed of where you've come from, yeah. and then you're like, oh, no, I'm not going to tell people because that's not who I am anymore. Um, I think coming into it unhindered in one sense is being able to just speak freely about what it is that God's done for you and being able to give thanks for that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, people ask me a lot because I was pregnant when I got married, which now is 22 years ago, but people would ask me a lot, like, well, you know, how can you share that? Or how can you tell people that? <laughs> and I think, yeah, at one season in my life, I had that same feeling, like, oh my gosh, if anybody knows this, and will they judge me, or will they think this in the early days? And then I thought, you know what? God brought me here. I didn't do this. I didn't show up one day and become what I am. And if people don't think I qualify, they can blame it on God, <laughs> because <laughs> he's the one that's allowed it. But that type of story for me, What's funny about it is, is that when I was 13 years old, I received a prophetic word, which would be like a word from God about your future. I received a word that said, 
one day you will minister to women who want to have abortions, who, but they're looking for an, a, a different you know, type of, and I thought that was a weird thing to say to a 13 year old in case anybody's wondering, and I would not advise it. I don't believe that's the right way. But at the moment I thought, oh my gosh, why would I ever do that? And then here I am 20 years old and making a choice to have a baby um, unwed at the time. And w for me now, looking back, I realized like that word came back up in my heart when I was pregnant with Brooklyn. And I can still remember because I, I talk about the sense of gratefulness for me being unhindered. I walked into her room that we were preparing after Jason and I got married and I was five and a half months pregnant. And I remember sitting in this hodgepodge room where nothing matched because I couldn't afford anything. And it was a really funky time in my life because I knew God had forgiven me, but now I'm walking out this life that everybody sees. My sin was gonna live longer than my repentance, so to speak. Yeah. And I was sitting in her room and I just began to sing this song that resonates with me called Peace, Peace, Wonderful Peace. I couldn't remember how I knew it, Sam. I was thinking, how do I know this song? I, I didn't know where I knew it. Several months later, Brooklyn's born. We're on vacation with my dad and mom. She's probably nine months old. She was having a hard time sleeping. And my dad came upstairs in a rental house we were in and he said, can I hold the baby? I'll, I'll just go get some rest. And he picked her up in his arms and he was swaying her around and he said, Peace, peace, wonderful peace. He just started singing the exact song I had sat in that room and sang. And it was like the Holy Spirit just connected it for me. The same part that was in him is in you, it's in her. There's nothing lost. It didn't come about the way you thought, but there's nothing lost. So that sense of unhinderedness for me is so real, so potent, and so powerful. Yeah, and that's incredible. And I think um, stories are like just story not just your testimony stories like that i think people resonate with that so much um and that's why i love these evenings where we sit here and we can chat and we can just dig into like different stories and places of where you come from because i think like you say that people connect with stories definitely um, and like we know everyone has a story and, and we'd love to hear them as well like we even even if we're not going to respond to the chat tonight like if you put it in then it will be read um and i think stories are so powerful that we can really like dig into that and we can support each other from it we can learn from it and we can grow closer to god from people's stories and we really appreciate you um telling us your stories and sharing those because like i, said, I think people connect so much um with that and it, it links in so well to what we're talking about um and i think you went on to say about grace uh, gratefulness always has a return um and again it's one of those things that i think in in the church, people can sometimes look at it and be like, oh, well, yeah, but now you know it's got to return. Is it bad that you're doing it because you know that there's going to be a return, even if you're not going for the return that you're thinking about? Because you spoke in a different way. It's like when people give, people say, oh, if you give, you'll, you'll receive. Right. Um, and I think people can struggle with that. But you were turning this in a different perspective of um, when you're, like, you're asking for this miracle, God gives you the miracle of healing but then you were talking about how the leper then went back um, and then he restored his soul. Mm -hmm. And this was really powerful. I think um, I speak for everyone that, that heard what you were saying. It's so powerful that um, God obviously wants to heal like physically and he will heal physically, but he's more interested in healing the soul. Um, yeah. Can you dig into that more? Because I think people like, need to hear it and want to hear it. Like, that's so important. Yeah, so there's a, another place in scripture that, you know, time just gets away from you and services to be able to get to. But there's a, a great story in scripture about what we, we call them four crazy friends. You know, you probably heard a thousand times. Well, I even got a little small audience that's all shaking their head right now. Like, yeah, we know exactly what you're talking about, four crazy friends. And, but what, why, I mean, that's probably more of a sermon than is legitimate because there's no indication that these people were friends. There's just an indication that four people came along, saw a guy who couldn't get into a service with Jesus and said, we got to figure out how to help him get in. And they open up the rooftop and they lower him in, yeah. right? We all know the story. <clears throat> but when Jesus looks at him, he, he not only heals him, his immediate reaction, it's the only time in that anybody that Jesus heals that he calls him son. The only time. And what makes it so significant, if you know anything about Hebrew history, is that no one who was an invalid would have never, they would have always been cared for by their family. 
So the fact that this man had no one to get him where he needed to go meant he had been abandoned by his family. So even though Jesus healed the symptoms of the man and got him to a place that he no longer needed the bed to walk, he calls him son when he heals him, and then he tells him, return to your family. He tells him, go back to the place that rejected you. Because his interest was not just in getting him out of a bed. His interest was in returning him back to a life that was prosperous, that was taking him somewhere, that was molding him into something more. So I think most of the time when we read scripture, we sometimes only look at the surface things because we don't understand the depth of history or we don't understand the depth of the word. And I I think John, he's a great one to read if you ever read the book of John because the book of John takes a different approach. His approach is continually to help you see that everything Jesus does as a miracle is only a sign to teach you the greater miracle, which is that human restoration, that ability to become better. So for me, like in my own personal life, I realize there's tons of things that God's done for me that honestly were not the real changing point. You know, getting, getting out of debt is great, but good people can get out of debt. I mean, you, yeah. you don't have to be a Christian to get out of debt. Getting out of debt is a practice, it's a habit, it's a skill set. But getting out of debt and living a life that isn't full of poverty mentality. Yeah where you withhold everything or think you got to save everything for life because you're afraid of losing it, that's the difference. The difference is God doesn't want you just to get out of debt. He wants to teach you how to manage money where you're not afraid of it or you don't carry a mentality to feel like you got to hold on to it. You can never release it because you'll never have it again. That's that soul health. Yeah. Right? That's that soul health. And that's, I, I love that because a lot of the time people see miracles as a physical thing. Like so many times it's a, so the miracle of um, sight or hearing. Right. Um, being able to walk in and so on and so forth. Whereas what you're talking about is so much deeper than that. And it's like you say, the, the changing of a mentality to doing that where yeah. um, anyone that's had money troubles or um, has struggled with debt and stuff, like breaking that chain of, no, I need to hold on to it instead mm-hmm. of letting it flow through you um, and not just, just grabbing and holding. Yeah, that's um, right. And it's debilitating, isn't it? If you live that way, um, because you just you're held by that and it is chains but god's here to break chains um, yeah. and he's in the business of breaking chains and setting free and i think people people worry too much that um they're asking the wrong kind of things because they're, they're like oh get me out of debt but it's not just get me out of debt it's, yeah teach it's, me how to teach handle me money more. yeah teach and, me how to and god wants to absolutely I think chris chris spicer spoke um, um a few times about how um, he was at work one day when he was a carpenter and he was shot fitting and he said that he felt out of his depth. He'd been given some plans and he was like, I don't know what I'm doing. How am I supposed to do this? And he went into the bathroom and he just sat there and he prayed. And he was like, God, you need to show me how to do this. And God's interested. Like, he wants to help through that and he wants to help with everything. And that's the God that we yeah. love and we serve. He, God's not afraid of our vulnerability. No. We are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we are. We're afraid of our vulnerability, yeah. right? I think there's something, we don't probably preach it enough, but there's something connected in scripture why Adam and Eve didn't need clothing, right? I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to make a a suggestion for nudist (laughs) colonies here, just in case you're watching and you just came up here. (laughs) But what I am trying to say is, I think there was a spiritual connection to that, that you didn't have to have anything, you were unashamed. Your, yeah. your sense of nakedness wasn't the same way we see nakedness. God wasn't afraid of that, neither were they, because they were covered in glory. They were covered in him. They were covered in him. Yeah. And even though I don't think we're going back to the physical <laughs> manifestation of that, just so everybody knows, I, and please don't come that way. Scott, um, put your top back on. Yeah, exactly. Time. Everybody that was undressing, <laughs> get redressed. But I do think at the same time, God is trying to restore a people who are not afraid of what it means to be vulnerable before him. Yeah. And be vulnerable for other people. Um, I, th- I think there's something really special and healing, healing in that. That sense of gratefulness just to say, okay, God, I'm not, I'm going to say I'm sorry. I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to say I'm grateful even when things around me don't feel like I should be. Yeah. I'm still going to do it because there's a return in that for me. Yeah, it's so good. And I think the vulnerability side kind of leads again into your last point that you made this morning, which is gratefulness has a sound. Mm-hmm. Um, and this morning, I, it was very powerful when you started singing, people started singing. And for me, like, 
you were saying, oh, it doesn't matter if you can't sing. I don't feel as I can sing. I'm, <laughs> I'm a very introvert man. Um, I'm, I'm very, um, yeah, very introvert most of the time. And to sing out and sing a song that's not got words on the screen or a song that's going to can make me feel vulnerable. Mm. But even in that moment where I started to, um, like, the power that you can feel from that mm. and God moving, moving through you um, and just feel like God touching you in that moment because you're coming vulnerable and you're laying it down of, you know what, yeah, I feel as though I might not be right, but that doesn't matter to God because he doesn't care if you can sing. Um, yeah. He just, wants, he just wants you to be praising and worshipping and you were saying how um, it is that gratefulness has a sound. And that moment of everyone singing their own song of gratefulness and thankfulness to God is just so powerful. Um, and for me, I think worship as a whole, like whenever I put worship music on, there's, there's a touch of heaven there. You, can, totally. like you feel God moving. Um, totally. And it doesn't matter if I'm in the car, sitting at home, whatever it is, like worship music will just completely build a mood and atmosphere, which is what you were talking about. Um, and I just think that's so incredible. So if in a second we're going to have um, our worship time and then after that we're going to come back and I'd love you to pray for everyone before we close. But is there anything else you want to add about the gratefulness has a sound because that was a point that you wanted to linger on more this morning. Is there anything you'd like to say to yeah, everyone tonight? I did want to linger on it because I, th I think there is something that right now, even wherever you're at, in your home, in, in your truck, in your car, I think as we enter into worship here, I think there's something that God just wants to do for you. And, and if you weren't a part today, or if you have an opportunity, just do what Sam did and let it go. It's so funny, Sam, because about six months ago, I wouldn't say that I'm like a singer, right? But I had to sing alto for my mom for many, many years. So I was forced into it. I'm a forced singer. But the Lord started to use that in me a little bit more. And I think it's the same thing you just said. It was the willingness to be vulnerable to say, okay, God, I'm yielding myself to you. And we want to encourage you in this moment as we go to worship, yield yourself. Just take a minute. Maybe you're by yourself, maybe with your family. Maybe you're sitting next to one of your children. Just yield yourself. Give God an opportunity to let your voice be heard. Don't just listen to this music. Let it come and well up from within you. If you're not a Christ follower, you can still start. It's okay. It will move you. It will shake yeah. you. It will do something in you. We really believe that. Yeah. So now we will go into the worship. And like Amanda said, just sing along, like praise God, because he's going to come down from heaven. He's going to touch you and he will change your life. Amen. Here it is. All the 
fantastic time of worship and um, like I said we're just going to get Amanda to pray for us to close just praying over this this sense of gratefulness so Amanda can you pray for everyone that's absolutely sitting at home? thanks Sam thanks for having me tonight thanks oh, for allowing no, me to be you. here everyone that's out there tonight we just want you to know number one we love you but more importantly God does and I don't know what you're facing I don't know what's coming at you I don't know what your world's looking like but what I do know is is God's in the midst of it and he wants you to know his, the tangible evidence of his spirit. He wants you to feel his presence. He wants to envelop you in his love. He wants to overtake you today. So as I pray, what I'm praying for is I'm praying for that encounter with God. I'm praying that in the next 30 seconds, you're going to feel something you never felt before. You may not understand it. Maybe a tear comes down your eye. Maybe you feel an overwhelming sense of joy. Maybe your mind's in the way and you have to tell your mind to get out of the way so that you can receive. But whatever it is, I believe that God wants to touch your life. 
if you're believing God for a business contract, if you're believing to go to the next level, if you're believing for a child, if you're believing for your, for your loved ones, whatever it is, I'm believing that God's going to touch your life. So right now, Lord, I thank you for men and women, children, young people that are listening to the sound of my voice tonight. I thank you for the privilege to communicate your heart to first tell them you're deeply in love with them. I'm asking you that by your spirit that is unhindered, that it will begin to overshadow them in every arena that they're facing, whether they're at home, whether they're in a vehicle, whether they're at work, that right now they feel your love. Lord, I'm asking you right now that you will cause them to feel the abandonment of your goodness upon them, that they will feel the overwhelming joy of what it means to walk in the goodness of God. Thank you that the joy of the Lord is their strength, that it's strengthening them from within, that whatever they're facing, they felt weakened, that right now your joy is ministering strength to them. I thank you, Lord, that you're turning places that have been in shadows into the light. I thank you that there's places that have felt as if they're dark and trying, that you're putting things back together and shifting it into the light of your promise. Lord, I speak to the promises over men and women, things that have not come to pass, but they are on the horizon, that right now as they lift up a grateful heart to you, that you will shift the atmosphere of what it is that's been held up and it will begin to pour out upon them because you are a God who rewards those who diligently seek you. So Lord, thank you for doing what only you can do. Minister to your people in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you again, Pastor Amanda, for coming and speaking to us and digging deeper and yeah. using it, drinking water. Yeah, but man. we'll come back to that another time. <laughs> with a okay, let's do it. <laughs> um, and thanks for tuning in, everyone, and we'll see you next week, same time online.